Okay. Anyway, this is um, talk four on um, and today's uh, on Roadblocks to Republic one, part one. Now, when you hear part one, what do you think? Yeah, eventually, right, right. It's just a matter of, I mean, it's not like there isn't anything to discuss with regards to that. Uh, but, you know, having, gone, having been in the 18th and then the 19th centuries, there is a little ways to go here. Uh, and that will eventually come. I'll eventually do that. So, uh, yeah, this is really part one. Uh, but today is flirtation with dictatorship. Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln. Now, that really doesn't get a lot of press or coverage or discussion, whatever the case may be. But, I mean, let's understand something here. And, I, and of course, you've heard me say this before. You know, you are in this war here at this point, what's going to be an industrialized, corporatized, commercialized war. This is what's coming. And the American, what we call the American Civil War, which I like to call the Revolt of the Planters, because if you remember in that Revolt of the Planters series, the first talk in that series was uh, people who own the country ought to run it. Which, I, which that quote comes from John Jay, where you're beginning to see at, as this country is being formed, uh, two, two doctrines. The Jeffersonian doctrine of the, of the agrarian as the salt of the earth, you know, Jefferson here, the person digging in the dirt, is the best protector of Republican elective limited government. Limited government. You know, you, you only have three million people in the country when it's formed. How limited can government be here, right? You know, we, we, we don't have a massive transportation system. We don't have an energy department. We don't have an education department. It's limited government. But Jefferson believes in elective government However, this government has, or this country has, limited suffrage. And I'm going to hit that again. But the fact of the matter is, you know, elective Republican limited government here. And interesting here, too, here we go. There we are. And so interesting here, too, you got the Hamiltonian notion here of, no, we're not, we're not going to this, uh, you know, Jefferson notion of, of people who dig in the dirt as, as, as the sole proponents of Republican government, you know, and then, and then bringing in people from the outside, uh, you know, uh, the, the, this loosey-goosey approach to government, uh, no, the lack, of, lack of centralized control, uh, this mobocracy that he, that he wants to bring forward, which Jefferson will look upon, uh, you know, the, the, the cities. Jefferson didn't trust cities that people moving off the land into the cities, since they don't dig in the dirt, and they're living in tenements or whatever the case may be, what's going to be known as the proletariat, the factory worker, does not have that regard for representative government. And he calls people who wield that doctrine, like big businessmen, bankers, and stockbrokers, as tinseled aristocrats. I love reading the founders because, boy, the way they phrase the language. Boy, do they have it knocked here. You know, just like other people down the road like Winston Churchill. Boy, if anyone knew how to use the English language, it's Churchill. But then again, when you go back to your founders, boy, they knew how to use that. It's an English class, really, is what you're seeing here. But these two doctrines, the Hamiltonian doctrine, the Jeffersonian doctrine, are really the basis as to why you're going to eventually have a war. You know, it's only a matter of time uh, we get to that point. Which doctrine is actually going to take control of the country? Of course, the Jeffersonian notion will be championed by those below the Mason-Dixon line, and the Hamiltonian notion is going to be championed by those above the Mason-Dixon line, and you know what's going to happen after that. However, having said that, Having said that, you know, another I like these quotes. Um, when it came to this flirtation with dictatorship, I found a quotation by Joseph Addison. Nothing is more gratifying to the mind of man than power or dominion. You think there's truth to that one? Oh, yeah. There sure is. We've seen that ever since man began walking upright, for Pete's sakes. But man characteristically has an appetite for power. He has an appetite for power. 
And that, can be, and that power can be used for the betterment of man. That power can be used to the detriment of man. We know that. However, for centuries, we've had one type of rule. Autocratic, based really on, what, royalty for the most part? Emperors, kings, queens, so on and so forth. It's been imperial in approach. I mean, even go back many years before Christ, for Pete's sakes. You know, in, in the Middle East. Mesopotamia, you know, cities like Ur, Nippur, so-called royal families, they proclaim themselves royal, and using, and using this thing known, put together by man, God didn't put this together, religion to help keep people in line. What is it Marx once said? Religion is the opiate of the masses. He's right about that. He's right about that. That doesn't mean there's not a creator, I'm not going there. Because many of your founders were deists. They just didn't believe in religion. Uh, there's pretty good reasons why you right, why they didn't. And so, but you've seen for centuries a few people control the land, and the mass is tied to working on the land. For really not much in the way of recompense here. Yet when you get to the, you know, after 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 the Renaissance here, and even just before, even really just before, when you go back to the time of the bubonic plague, by 1350, when the Portuguese begin bringing blacks in from Africa to Portugal, not the New World, to Portugal, you know, the 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 plague wiped out anywhere from, depending on what source you consult, a quarter to one third of Europe. That's a lot of people, but then again. You know, it's not just royalty that's dying here, or nobility, or soldiers. How about peasants, the farmers? Who's growing the food and processing the food here? You know, you have to have, people got to eat. And so, maybe after the plague, starvation, famine? And so, the Portuguese came upon the idea of bringing blacks in here and using them as slaves to work the land for the Portuguese. Here we go with that. And so, but however, when you go a, several, a couple of three centuries down the road, you know, the Renaissance, uh, and, but then again, this developing thing known as the Industrial Revolution, capitalism, evolving technology, you know, ideas of the age of reason, enlightenment, Gutenberg, the printing press. I mean, now people are beginning to think out of the box. They're challenging tradition. They're challenging, they're challenging convention. A lot of this royalty and religion. Two of the biggest banes of human and civil rights in history. That's what they are. You don't need me to tell you that. All you got to do is read history, you see this. It's what history tells us. However, having said that, you see in places like England, challenge to royal rule here. You even go back to Charles I, who was flirting with the Catholics. You think Presbyterians in Parliament like that one? I don't think so. And so here you see here, this, this beginning of the solidification coming on here of constitutional monarchy. Maybe, maybe royals aren't absolute. You know this stuff, divine right of kings? Uh, and so you see here parliamentary poli politics. You begin to see constitutional monarchy. Maybe we need a legislative branch to keep the monarch in line. Now you're beginning to see what? a pseudo-democratic style of government here emerging here? You're beginning to see it. And then fast forward to the next century, you know, the 18th. And what do you see in America? America, yes. You know, some of your founders here consulting people like John Locke, Montesquieu, people like this, Thomas Hobbes, who the Texas Board of Ed wants to take out of the, who wanted to take out of the curriculum. Thomas Hobbes, who wrote that book, Leviathan. Uh, and replace them with Moses? Yeah, they're really on their game, aren't they? And so here, here you see Americans not only looking maybe for constitutional monarchy or having a parliamentary form of government. No, we're throwing a monarch out. And we're going with a republican form of government. A republic with its checks and balances. You know, a republic where you have a legislative branch, a, ju a judicial branch, and a chief executive, but all with a system of checks and balances. They'll all bounce off each other, offered, offered a quality of rule here 
something, something John Locke believed in, something Montesquieu believed in, although I think it was Montesquieu who believed that, you know, equality among the branches, yes, but maybe the legislative branch should be more equal than the other two. I mean, keep in mind here, if you really think about it, you know, what is your firewall for your government? The people you elect to Congress, right? They should be the firewall here. How has that been working out in the last 20 years? Yeah, it's working out great, hasn't it? And all of a sudden, it seems like some of them want to take that power back. The question you have to ask here is, are we, is that, is that kind of late in the game here? That's the question you as a voter have to ask. And that's one reason you've seen the rise of a Trump or a Sanders. There are people on both polls here who are getting sick and tired and fed up and want to do and, and it and maybe even do away with the establishment. And the establishment is fighting to keep their privileged position. I mean, that's evident here. Well, how'd you get here? Well, part of that is flirtation with dictatorship. Then you have the French. You know, the Americans, we threw out, the Americans threw out the crown here. But understand something here, too, and this is a big one. Uh, you know, when Am the Americans were fighting one crown, George III, he's not even here, he's 3,000 miles away. You know, you had globalization even then. When the world's being traversed by wooden sail in 1700 and 1750, how do you think globalization is today? You think you're going to get away from it? I don't think so. Even Albania can be inf infected here. Remember Enver Hoxha here, wanted to keep it insulated here? How about, how about a Kim Jong-un uh, Jong today? And if China has the uh, coronavirus, you don't think North Korea has it? Because South Korea reported this morning. They have 833 cases. And North Korea, is, last I checked, was in between South Korea and China. So you don't think they don't have it? Yeah. The only thing is, how do they solve the problem? Maybe? I don't know. That could be. That could be. But, you know, I mean, the, the world being the way it is. And so here you see with the French, you know, trying to follow the, Amer the American model here. But we're 3,000 miles from Europe. It's, it's hard for the British to maintain an army here. And they're stretched. They're also moving into the Middle East to protect colonial India. How, you know, they're a superpower of the day, but they're still stretched. France is a different story. In France, in France, they are in the belly of the beast. Sure, they're going to start by tangling with the Bourbons to throw them out, Louis XVI being the poster child expression of that. But at the same time here, they are in the belly of the beast from the perspective you think the czar wants to see these ideas rise, these ideas of liberalism, democracy, republicanism, secularism, socialism, so on and so forth? The Habsburgs, again, George III. How about the Spanish? No, they don't want this. This has to be, this has to be killed in the womb. And so by 1792, you know, in 1793, January to be exact, what's going to happen to Louis XVI? Going to that French haircutting machine from the neck up. And then, of course, that feeds on itself. But they want to stop these ideas because even it gets to the point where some of these revolutionaries, gee whiz, if we can get rid of the monarch here, how does this, how does this revolution survive? By spreading the revolution cross borders. And you don't think the monarchs don't know that one. That, this has to stop. And so in 1792, the Great French War starts. And so from 1792 to 18, two were the French Revolutionary Wars. And then 18, after the French Revolution degenerates into dictatorship, and that's really the end of the Republic. That's really the end of the Republic. And then 18, 18, 15, the Napoleonic conflicts, which it starts really as a revolution and then degenerates into a continental-wide war. Well, what happened here? Yet again, you had these glimmers, like the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, which is based off our, our Declaration of Independence. 
you know, one of the, one of the authors here is Lafayette, who was a proponent of Jefferson. And they're excited here about this. They're excited here about this, what's going on. Of course, then even many American, the founders get turned off be, because of how the, the, the revolution degenerates into that unbridled violence, something we didn't have here to that extent. But their situation is different. We're away from Europe. They're in Europe. You know, they're, they're, they're going to be, they're going to, they're going to be stuck with this, the French. However, what does that mean with regards to, with regards to, um, I mean, what, what you're seeing here with the American Civil War? Here, though, interestingly enough, by eight, the 1850s, 1860, you know, the two sides, the two sides are really becoming solidified here. I'm talking the southern aristocracy and the northern business interests. Agrarian capitalism versus industrial capitalism. And keep in mind, too, something in the background, and I mentioned this in that revolt of the planters, one of the reasons we will develop the way we do, as opposed to degenerating into what happened in France, we didn't have feudalism here. We skipped that one. Thank God we did. And so in France, in France, you have the peasants and, and farmers here who, yes, most of them do own their land, but they don't make enough to support the land. And so what are they doing? You know, while the, hus while the wife and the kids are working the land, maybe the husband's out selling himself to work. Or maybe they're actually using some of their land, you know, sharecropping, for one of the privileged, one of the landowners privileged. You know, so they, they really have a problem here. And so when the revolution starts and bread prices go up, how, how are they or the working class going to afford to eat? Well, now we got to have a revolution to straighten that out. We didn't have that here. We didn't have that here. When the whites came here, they began to get the land. They began, of course, they took it from the Indians. I'll give you that. You know, the, 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 it's not like it was given to them, laying a land dripping with milk and honey. You know that one. But we skipped that, and so capitalism in this regard will get a boost. But the idea of, the, of, a, of an elective republic is here is based on limited suffrage. Only white males with property could vote. Even if you were a poor white male, you think you're voting? No, you're not. Of course, that's going to loosen up as we go along here. And as the country expands, more people are owning property, and so the power is being dispersed. As Adam said, the more people own, own land, the, more, the better chance you have a functioning system of representative government. But at the same time here, by the 1850s, you know, the southern aristocracy, the landed gentry here, the plantation owners who run that concentration camp system, really run the roost down here. And so when you get to 1860 and they want to secede and form their own country here, they form their own country, you know, they consider themselves the real defenders of states' rights. We are the real defenders of the Constitution. If you ever read the Southern Constitution as opposed to our Constitution, there's more references to slavery in it. Slaves are considered what? Property. They're considered part of property. And so they're moving beyond what was in our, in our original Constitution, the Three-Fifths Compromise, just so Southern, one, of those, one, of those, one of those schemes that the mechanisms that, that the that, that the, the founders used to keep the South in the fold here. You know, you don't fight a revolution and throw out the oppressor. That's what's keeping you together. You don't throw the oppressor out and then feel, well, okay, now we're a nation. You got to have something so that both sides stick. There has to be another commonality here. Well, that commonality is land. Of course, down here, down here, you, you, you make sure that if you have less people in the South, more people in the North, you throw, those less, you throw that grouping that has less people a bone here. Three-fifths compromise. And so when you're writing things like consent of the governed, you know, people will be able to determine their own fate, you've got a sizable aspect of the population who are black who can't enjoy consent of the governed. They're not even considered people. Not much above what the Nazis considered Jewish people, gypsies, and Slavs. 
Untermensch, translated into subhuman. And so, three fifths compromise. You know, even though there aren't as many whites down south as up north, they can count three fifths or 60% of their black charges toward representation in Congress. So, if you've got about 650,000 slaves down south, round numbers, then you can count, what, 415, 416, 17,000 of them as people towards representation in Congress. And that's, and that's okay for the Southerners. Well, why wouldn't it be? Yet, they can't vote. The people who are counted as people can't vote. And I think I might have mentioned last week, too, when I went to that program on gerrymandering, well, it's almost about three weeks ago, talking about prison gerrymandering in this state where prisons are set up in certain areas of the state where, you know, uh, it's the total amount of the people in a district that gets you that district, not registered voters. And so when many of your political, many, many of your, much of your prison population are black and Latino, they can't vote, but the white people living in that district can. Wow. And that, that's part of that lawsuit, the NAACP against Merrill, that's ongoing here. Um, inter interesting lawsuit. Interesting lawsuit. But at the same time here, so you see, as, you know, as, as, the southern, as the southern aristocracy benefits from owning the plantation system because they're growing the cash crops here. The tobacco, the sugar, the rice, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the, you know, even indigo here and obviously cotton. But the mass of the population does not own slaves. The few do. And it's also that few who have, the, have much of the arable land. But they're growing the cash crops. And the small white farmers, what they produce, you know, livestock, grain, and things of this nature, is, is bought by, mainly by the plantations. So they're now beholden to that system. Yet up north, that's not what's going on here. Up north, yeah, most people are farmers, but you've seen a big boost in the factory system. You know, whether in 1861, down south, you have 20,681 factories, that sounds like a lot, and maybe 110, 120,000 people working in them. Up north, with a population of 23 million, 22, 23 million up north. You've got over 110,000 factories with over 1,100,000 working in them. And so when you take a look at what's going to happen here, you know, in 1860, when, when um, the Southerners produced 76,000 tons of steel and the North produces 2,500,000 tons of steel, who do you think is going to win this war? It's not going to be hard to figure that one out in the long run. And so, interesting here too, the North, the North seemed to be more attuned to having men other than white men to be in their army, and white men who were born here. How about Irish immigrants? How about German immigrants? 20% of the Union Army, it's estimated, was German or French immigrants. And add another 180,000 black men in a blue uniform. This is a, this is a UN Army compared to the South. Fascinating here, isn't it? Yeah. But then again, you know, what starts, you know, with, with very few, very few men in these armies, you know, as the factories change over from a peacetime to a wartime economy, you have to see stronger central government for this. Somebody has to take control of this. And even prior to the shelling, even to the prior to the even prior to the shelling of Fort Sumter in April 1861, the so-called militias in the southern states had to swear an allegiance the Richmond government. Even military equipment in these militias in southern states 
was now going to be beholden to the Confederate Army. Where is this going here? What's, hap what's slowly happening to states' rights here? You know, basing off what you saw when the country was formed, your founders did not want a large standing army. They thought it was a threat to the republic, looking at Britain, France, so on and so forth. And yet they go with a militia system where the governors control the mass of the soldiers, and the soldiers are what? It's a people's army. Every white male 18 to 45 is in the militia, and the governors control the militia, not Washington or the army. You know, and when the country is formed, 3 million people, approximately 3 million people in 13 states with an army of 2,630 2, men. How are 2,630 men going to defend 13 states? They have an adjunct, adjunct force. The militias. Every white male, 18 to 45. But Washington doesn't control that. The governors do. They control the militias. And the states appoint the officers, not the army, not Washington. And these guys buy their own guns, powder and ball, not the army. Talk about states' rights. <laughs> of course, this is an army looking to defend its uh, people, their, their towns, their cities, their farms. They're not, they're not being loaded on a boat to go to Iraq. That's what this is. People's army. And it says in your constitution the president can federalize these men, but according to the 1792 Militia Act, which bolsters the Second Amendment, only for three months. Then the president has to go back to Congress and ask for an extension. Gee, there's a novel idea keeping the leader in line. That's interesting. Talk about local power, state power. States' rights. You can read this in the 1792 Militia Act. Uh, Militia Act. That's an interesting piece of legislation. Yes. That will be superseded by the 193 National Guard Act, where, <coughs> where again, in this growth towards central power here, uh, you know, we, you know, we've already had the Spanish-American War, and the Army didn't do as well here. The Navy did great, but the Army didn't do quite as well. And so now you have to begin to structure this. Uh, you know, if you need men in the Philippines in the jungles to bolster the regulars, I mean, you can't just rely on volunteers. Now you, need a, now you need a bona fide reserve, and that's where you're going here. And so instead of having every, uh, everybody in his uncle showing up with the, you know, the militia with a Winchester or a pump shotgun, now the army now the army's going to give these guys a Springfield or a bolt action Craig Jorgensen. And now these guys aren't going to be, aren't gonna be uh, federalized for three months. Try nine. And then later on down the road, it's for the duration of the war. And then these guys are going to be training with the Army regulars five days a year and get paid for them. They weren't getting that before. But what happens when Washington shells out more money for it? Who begins to usurp control? Washington. That's where you're going here. Well, when you go back to 1860 and go back to what I just mentioned about, about the Confederacy, you know, uh, these guys now are not only taking an oath, oath to the state they're in, now to the Richmond government. Their equipment, cannons, so on and so forth, is also beholden to the Richmond government. And so this, the, 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 the idea of Southerners being the, being the champions of states' rights and constitutional rights, that's another one, Const the Constitution. Sure, consent of the governed, but not for 40 to 44 percent of the population down south, blacks, slaves. They're not even, again, even in their constitution, they're not even considered humans. They're considered property. There's numerous, you can see this in the Confederate Constitution, there's numerous references to it. And so when the war starts, they're going out with volunteers, yes. But in April 1862, what does the Confederate Congress pass? A draft. They have to have them. And then, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, the Confederate Congress gives Jefferson Davis the right to suspend habeas corpus. I believe that was March 1862, and that same month after General George McClellan lands, 
lands that 100,000 man Union Army on the Virginia Peninsula, and Lincoln wants the war over now, 1862. I want it over now. And they're supposed to go across that peninsula to take Richmond and end this. And so Jefferson Davis is going to order the evacuation by the Confederate government from Richmond. And General John H. Winder will be the military governor of Richmond. And he's going to institute martial law. The same General Winder who will later be the commander at Andersonville Prison. And he does things like having passport type paperwork every time you're leaving or entering Richmond. He has to know who's getting on the train, who's getting off the train. He has to know who's leaving the inn and who's entering the inn. Who's leaving the hotel, entering the motel. He also wants to control prices. Holy Christmas, the Confederate Congress is against that. And ration food if that's necessary. And, and, if you're a civilian, you've got to turn your gun into the Confederate Ordnance Bureau. And that makes some of these people happy. You know, we know how people, Southerners are about guns, aren't they? But this is, this is martial law. This is martial law. You don't think you're not seeing the end of states' rights here? This is martial law. Lincoln, up north, you know, Maryland is a tough state. Maryland is a state. Like maybe even states like Kentucky, um, maybe even Tennessee, you want to consider that a border, although some people consider it a southern state. But states like this, sticking with Maryland for a moment, you know, many times Lincoln went through Maryland on the train at night. There were many Southern sympathizers in Maryland. In fact, uh, there was a Massachusetts regiment marching through Maryland toward Washington, D.C. Now, keep in mind, if you, if you, you, know, you, can, you can look, Maryland surrounds Washington, D.C. on what, three sides? And then there's another side that's, uh, that's hemmed in by what, Virginia? Picture yourself in 1861. How does that look? especially when you have a lot of Southern sympathizers in Maryland. Maryland's a tough state, again. And so as this Massachusetts regiment is marching toward the capital, they're actually attacked by some Maryland residents, Southern sympathizers. And the regiment shoots back and kills 11 people. That's going to lead to three or four days of rioting, you know, Rounds of unpleasantry here, attacks on federal property, additional attacks on federal troops or federal employees. And what do you think that's going to lead to? Lincoln's going to retaliate. He's going to occupy Annapolis, Baltimore. The mayor is going to be arrested. Uh, the chief of police will be arrested. 31 members. 31 members of the Maryland State Legislature are going to be arrested. Democrats, you know, Lincoln's a Republican, right? The, the Democrats here, known as copperheads, especially in states like Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, you know, many of them voted for Stephen Douglas. They didn't vote for Abraham Lincoln. You know, Abraham Lincoln, is very, isn't he revered today? He wasn't revered by everybody in the North back in this era. Not everybody. A lot of people didn't. Why? They didn't like the way the country was going, but now you were in a large war, a large conventional war. Now the Bill of Rights just went out the window. Take a look at what happened to Upton Sinclair in 1917 when we got into the First World War and he was reading the Bill of Rights in public and he got arrested. Everyone has to be on the same page, whether they like it or not. <laughs> whether they like it or not. And so Lincoln is not only going to crack down on people in Maryland, but there are people with southern sympathies in state, border states like Kentucky. And during the war, during the war, between 1861 and 1865, he's going to have some 15,000 people rounded up. 
Is that the Lincoln that's usually talked about here? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. And most, all, most of them will not be tried in a civil court. Try, to, try a military tribunal. That's where you are. That's where you are. You have to maintain order, especially as the economy here is being weaned off peacetime to wartime. 1863, the North will adopt dra a draft. You think that made everybody happy here? No. Nope. Of course, if you had three hundred dollars, you could get out. You can get out of out of the out of the requirement here. You can get out of the requirement. Yet, it's easier up north to get people unified here from the perspective, okay, 20% of the army are Irish and German immigrants. You, you know, this is a way for them to become citizens, isn't it? It sure is, especially after where they came from. Keep in mind, 1848, the springtime of nations, the famine in Ireland, how many Irish died in that famine? History says a million? And that, two million, she says. But then another approximately, say, say, a million came here. And so some of these guys are going to join, and Germany, you know, well, the German states. The springtime of nations, there was revolution breaking out all over Europe. Kind of an aftermath of the French. And yet many Germans will come here. And many will join the army. You know, and both sides, the Confederacy and the Union, had desertions. Okay, they had desertions. However, it's easier to get an army like this built up north because, and keep in mind here, going back to what Jefferson stated, you know, and this isn't to say that these people are not patriotic. That's not the point. The point here is. He thinks, again, people who dig in the dirt are better able to run Republican limited elective government because they don't live in the cities. People who live in the cities have less regard for representative government. That's, that's Jefferson. And so when you see this idea of urbanization, that means what? Perhaps, in a certain respect, more a more cohesive society. You've got more people living in, in, on fewer land, on, on less land here as opposed to farmers who are spread out. There's a higher grade, perhaps, of individualism. Now, that's a discussion you can take up. That's what's down south. That's what Jefferson Davis is, against, is up against. This so-called rugged individualism of the southerner. You know, when you have a plantation and you have this fiefdom, and that's what these are, it's not only a concentration camp system, these plantation owners run their area. They run their fiefdoms. This is ruralism in action. And yet the small farmer is catering to that because he's selling his livestock and grain to the, plant, to the local plantation owner. And it's the local plantation owner who, who grows and fosters those cash crops. But that gives that, that plantation owner a lot of power. And it also reinforces his individualism. Who do you think controls the state politics? The plantation owners. Most of the senators, most of the representatives, most of the governors in the South or representing the South to Washington are plantation owners. They have the power, both economic and political. That fosters their individualism. Not, not as much up north. So it's easier in, cert, to a certain, in a certain respect here to get people organized for an army. Plus they have a larger manpower pool anyway. Down south, there were nine million people. Just under four million, just under four million are slaves. They're not even people. They're property. So let's say round numbers. You got five million whites against what? Twenty-two or twenty-three million whites up in the north. And the proof will be in the pudding here because you're going to have some eight hundred and seventy-five thousand men, round numbers, who will have served in that Confederate army. And when you have a population of five million whites, you're stretching the population here. You're stretching it because not everybody is 18, 16 to 35 years old. And that's something else that happens to the, to the, to the South. When they first have a draft, eight, uh, 16 to tw six, seven, pardon me, 18 to 35. Then when the manpower gets to be a problem, 17 to 50. We need men. 
We need men. God forbid we arm the women. And so, and so that's another thing that changes here down south as well. You know, the Southern Belle. God, she's up here on a pedestal. Might not have much in the way of rights, but she's up here in Southern womanhood, right? Well, what happens to that? Even some of these silk-wearing bells are going to be where? In a place building things for the Confederate Army. It's changing. And so the, one of the real revolutions here is ruralization is dying, urbanization's on the ascent here in the South. And, and without provincialism, that's going to be the end of the power of the plantation owner. This is what war and centralized control of government is doing to the South. Interesting here, too, and, and I, I found this absolutely fascinating here. You know, when, when, when you take a look at what Josiah Gorgeous, the, commission, the, the man who runs the Bureau of Ordnance, or the, the Confederate Bureau of Ordnance, how he's, he's changing the economy. It's almost like what he's doing to the Southerners is almost like Bernard Baruch with the War Industries Board, 1917-1918. You know, you got a czar here for your economy, a czar. And even and even and even says st states here, you know, not only re and he took over what were once federal ordin ordin uh, ordinances down in in the south, arsenal, so on and so forth. Interesting. What had previously been United States arsenals, but opened others such as in Knoxville, Tennessee, Danville, Lynchburg, and Dublin, and Virginia, Jackson, and Mississippi, and some of these arsenals were modernized. Charleston, for, for instance, was steam-powered. Hmm. Modernization due to an unfolding emergency was suborning, suborning the antebellum south. And you can see this in Mississippi, 1863. An agrarian state. Mississippi was decidedly agrarian, yet now is on to that thing known as total war. Clothing factories in Jackson, Bankston, Columbus, Enterprise, Natchez, Woodville, Produced 10,000 gar garments a week for the Confederate Army. Factories in Jackson and Columbus produced 200 hats a day. Government contractors in Mississippi turned government contractors in Mississippi turned out 8,000 pairs of shoes a week. Establishments Enterprise in Canton made 60 wagons and ambulances per week, and a tannery in Magnolia processed 6,000 hides a day. Now, wow is right. Wow is right. The changes in the wind here. And yet, this is the result of strong central government. Somebody had to do this. Lincoln is not as fettered here, is not as fettered as, Je as Jefferson Davis is with Southern individualism. He doesn't totally get away with, with, with stamping out individual rights. But he's got the North organized for war. Total war. Total war as it existed here. Even to the extent that the army is going to do this. Grant, Sherman. You know, you can see where this goes. Strong central government organizing the economy and now the army. The army is no longer looking to fight the, an enemy army in the battlefield. They are now, even the army will be used to attack the southern economy. That is job one, 1864-65. What do we need to fight these battles for? Let's attack the economy so they can't wage war. That's part of the total war scheme. And does Lincoln go along with this? Of course he is. Even to the extent of fielding criticisms of Grant. He takes too many losses. Yeah, but he wins. He's a drunk. We'll find out what he drinks and give and parcel all that out to the rest of the generals. He wants to win. And like Roosevelt, maybe in 19, uh, and then the Second World War, 41 to 45, maybe he's kind of that perfect war leader here. Nothing's perfect, but you get what I mean here. Maybe he's that war leader. He's willing to go along with this. Why? Because he has to, really. He has to get this over with. 
Yet the North can the North can take the time. That's one thing they have the Southerners don't have. Time. Besides the factories, the resources, the men, the money. The money. The banking system. They got that. How much do you think the Confederate the currency is worth? And so when you take a look at this fledgling effort of state control and changing the, the economy for something known as war. That's the, that's, the only, that's the only objective here. War. You think that's what the founders wanted? I don't think so. I don't think so. Yet then again, the situation deems that it has to be done. And yet, as this goes on here, Congress quickly asserts its control when it's over with. Take a look up north. You know, this is a country, the North, the Union, you know, what's left of the United States that won the war, that has an army of 2,213,000 men. A regular army. A blooded army. That was unheard of. That was unheard of when the countries formed. 2,213,000 men. And this is an army, again, using technology uh, and, and, and scientific research and, and, and taking new things and using it. Even, in, even the Union Army at one point had, had a fledgling effort in air power going on here. The Balloon Corps. Aerial observation. Uh, you know, and where I work in Army Aviation Magazine, when I was uncovering all this research, you know, uh, going back into the Civil War records, and I printed out, and I have in my, I have in my, in my archives, every telegraphic message that I can get my hands on that Thaddeus Lowe with the Balloon Corps made from 1861 through eight, the part halfway through 1863. It's really a living record here of this use of air power. Even down to the point, and some, and some army officers are, are, are shocked at this, that the first time a general ordered an aircraft up to direct artillery fire from an aircraft is September 24, 1861, at Falls Church, Virginia. The general's name was William Farrar Smith, or Baldy Smith, if you're familiar with that name. And I have the, I have the transcript home. Interesting read. Send up a balloon, you know, and... and Adjust artillery fire. Boy, where is man taking his technology here? No longer now do we have to look where we're firing the gun. As long as you got the coordinates, you point the gun in the direction, you got the coordinate, you fire it. You don't have to see where the shell lands. The aircraft will do that for you. Wow. Rail guns. The train. Why not put artillery pieces on a train? Poison gas was discussed, and it was turned down. What's going to happen in 1915? Phosgene, chlorine, mustard, yeah, you know where that's going to go here. Uh, you know, repeating, repeating rifles, again, using this command economy to push forward the evolution of technology. Heck, what? What do you want the musket for? How about repeating rifles? Breech loaders, right? Instead of putting the powder in and the, and the ball in and then ramming it down and priming the cup and fire, you get two rounds off a minute, maybe three if you're proficient. Now you fire a gun, throw the breech, it just kicks out the, the, spent, the spent shell, and then it throw, you put in another one, bang, and just open up the breech. And then later on, what shows up? The Gatling gun. Now we're on a machine gun. So now these guys are digging trenches here because of the amount of lead being sent. And this is what this is what they do with the technology here. Now, some of this goes back to what Hegel once said. You know, war is change, peace is stagnation. You know, and so, but when it's over, Congress, there's there's still a Congress here that understands what the founders understood, and so this army of two million two hundred and thirteen thousand men up north. By September 1867, will be 57,000 men. 
and they'll keep reducing it from there on. Anything to break down this threat to the republic known as a regular army. Let's get rid of the trappings of this authoritarian style of rule. In fact, by the year Custer bought the farm, that army's down to 26,000 men, 1876. Even the Navy. The Navy had like 42 warships at the beginning of the war, had 674 when the war is over with, is down to, 40, down to 42 warships by, by 1868, 1869. And then by the 1870s, they only have like about 20, 24, 25 warships left. And so they go back to business as it was, but the problem here is, for the future, the northern idea of industrialization won the war. And so now you're going to go on a tear here building all these factories. Because keep in mind here, prior, up, prior to the Civil War, most Americans didn't trust corporations. They thought it was a threat to the republic. What have you turned into? Interesting here what you saw. But then again, what you saw with Jefferson Davis too, talking about the power of the chief executive. Maybe he had a power trying to rein in Southern individualism, but again, here during the war, he will issue 36 vetoes during the war. You know how many the Confederate Congress overturned? One. That's it. Only one. He got some of what he wanted here. As a strong central, as a strong executive. That's not states' rights. That's not states' rights. And so the idea, so this Southern Revolution dies. And another revol and other revolutions take hold here. How about instead of interesting here too, during the Civil War, uh, a, a, a class sprouts up here in the South. A war sponsored a class here. They're called government bureaucrats. Because of a strong central government, 70,000 bureaucrats. 70,000. So where is power going? From those states to where? Centralized control. Those, those bureaucrats are beholden to what? The capitals of the states? No. They're beholden to the capital of the country. Again. Stronger centralized control. And so the power that the southern, the southern, uh, the, the, the aristocracy had, they're losing here. And this industrialization, this attempt at a military industrial complex, which was late in the game for the South, but they have to, they have no choice, is kind of that first step here, if you will, toward urbanization and industrialization over the, for the South over the, over the, next, over the next years. Uh, you've seen this. I'm sure you've seen some of the towns you maybe you came from in this area, the old hat factories and clothing factories that were here. They were clothed. Where'd those jobs go? Of course, from there, where did they go? Somebody just said China. That's not South, is it? <laughs> And so maybe it went to South China, <laughs> but you know, but but these ch these stark changes happen over over a period of time, and again you see with in a rudimentary fashion Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln, what Woodrow Wilson, First World War, and then Franklin D Roosevelt in the Second World War, strong centralized control and people go along with it people go along with it you know things like wage wage and price controls I'm sure some of you maybe a few of you here were maybe children during the second world war sugar was rationed cheese was rationed salt was rationed gasoline you had gasoline sticker on your window Right, a lot of it went to the military. A lot of it went to the military. I was watching, um, yeah, yeah, they do. Um, I was wa in fact, I was watching um, Gung Ho the other night with Randolph Scott, Noah Beery, yeah, 1943. And um, 
Robert, that was one of Robert Mitchum's first movies. He's in that. Milburn Stone was the marine doctor. Remember him from Doc on Gunsmoke? Well, he didn't really get any farther. He's a doctor. But uh, the fact of the matter is, Noah Beery and his girlfriend walk into this diner, and it's on a Tuesday. And the, when the waiter says, well, what do you want? Oh, we'd like a couple of hamburgers. This is meatless Tuesday. We give up the meat for the military. I don't get it. These Marines come in here for their hamburgers, and it's meatless Tuesday. But that's just an example here of what the country was doing at the time. Meatless Tuesday. You couldn't, you couldn't get a steak or a hamburger if you went to a restaurant in 1943. You're going to take a salad and like it. Okay, well, we'll have coffee. But that's, an ex that's a dramatic example of what the country was doing here. You know, and then the gasoline. Gasoline rationing. You know, maybe you could get gasoline on Tuesdays and Fridays. Forget the rest of the week. You know. Yeah. And they also had ration books, too. Yeah. But you had a, you had a sticker on your window. Um, you know, you tell Americans they'd have to do that today. Some of them wouldn't know whether to poop or go blind. They really wouldn't. Because they don't know what it's like to sacrifice. Not in, not in a situation like this. You know, you know, and, and so when you have a country willing to do that, as opposed to 2001 when the president says, go out and shop, what kind of a country is this? What that kind of a leader is that? Go out and shop. No. No, we're going to come together and we're going to win this and put an end to it. That's 1941, not 2001. Different country. But again, when you take a look at what happened in World War I and compare it to what happened in the Civil War, then take a look what happened in World War II and compare that to the Civil War, you see these incremental steps of stronger so federal control. Based on, to a certain extent, the idea of, an indust of industrial capitalism, financial capitalism. You can't, fight, you can't fight an industrialized war without industrial capitalism. You can't do it. You can't do it. And you need finance and that evolution of technology. And that's where it goes. I mean, the, the, uh, stepping back and just taking a look at how technology affected war, it's enough to make your head spin. I mean, look at it this way. In, in, in 1861, the Northern Army began to use a balloon for aerial observation. And then, and then in World War I, you began to see the double wingers coming out, the, the, the air, airplanes doing the same thing. And then in World War II, you're seeing high-speed bombers and high-speed fighter planes. And so we've gone from 1861 to 1941, 80 years later, look what you're seeing with this thing known as air power. Take a look at that. Wow. I remember making, I was giving a talk on, on air power, and I said, you know, when, when, when you look at a man who was born in this state, came from Washington, Connecticut, his name is Ben Falloy, Benjamin Falloy. Benjamin Falloy is the first Army pilot to fly the first acknowledged Army aircraft. He's the third man to fly a Wright Brothers plane for the Army. The first acknowledged Army purchase was a dirigible. He flew that. But he also flew a Wright Brothers flyer. And interestingly enough, in 1910, this guy from Connecticut is flying the only Army plane in 1910. And he's keeping it up many times with money out of his own pocket. Shows you how much Congress was willing to spend on air power. And yet, that's 1910. Yet in 1945, General Hap Arnold of the United States Army Air Force has over 2.8 million men and over 80,000 aircraft. And many of them are planes like the P-51, which did over 440 miles an hour. And the B-29 with pressurized interior? And that's in 35 years. 
What did man do with this technology and ability to produce here? But then again, what has that done to to society? That's the question you have to ask. You know, we can all, and I, you know, even I am too. I'm enamored with what was produced here and 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 the and the technology. Uh, it's really it's really fascinating. But then again, what are the aftershocks on society and the political structure, so on and so forth? Interesting, interesting, fascinating when you take a look at it. But then again, yeah, it does take a closer look at Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln during this war to have a better understanding of those countries themselves. And what, what kind of an assault was it on the political structure to fight a war? Again, it's a forerunner of what's coming down the road after 1865. Because once people are willing to give up their rights for this, what else are they willing to give up their rights for later on? It's a test of your political structure. It's a test of your constitution and your bill of rights is what it is. That's, it's a test of that. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Anybody got any questions or, or comments or observations? Yeah, who, who get away with, with an equality of one? Like a Joe Stalin? To me, answer that question, Joe Stalin is the quintessential example here. Uh, he was going to industrialize the Soviet Union come hell or high water, and he doesn't care how many it's going to cost. But how do you get away with that? Even he has a problem here. But then again, for Uncle Joe, that's not a problem. Well, that too, but I mean, what he did was, you know, consider his agenda. He's got to take, like the South, for instance, he's got to take a country that's decidedly agrarian and backward, and, and which he'll do. But to do that, you know, the, he's, he's the successor to Lenin, and he's pushing this notion of, 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 of the Soviet Union as the poster child expression of the socialist agenda, which is a lot of hogwash. But he takes incidents like when the British government uh, in London cracked down on, this, on the Soviet, uh, Soviet, um, Soviet ministry here, uh, they, they, you know, because the Soviet diplomats here were sp were spying on the British, that were on England, and that's what they said. Well, they're probably right. They're probably right. Uh, in in China, uh, Chiang Kai Shek severely cracked down on the Chinese communists. Uh, in Poland, a Soviet diplomat was assassinated by a disgruntled Pole. And then in Ukraine. There were some coal miners who revolted because, or, or you know, went on strike because they want more money, and the Soviets have to crack down on that. Now Stalin's going to say, "You see, we as the as the leader flagship of the socialist agenda are under assault from within and without, and we have to industrialize and modernize from Mother Russia. This kind of, and it's going to work. He's going to get people to go along with this, and of course." He's going to forcefully industrialize the Soviet Union. And he will take no backlash here. Well, you know what's going to happen with the purges in the 1930s. And he gets away with it. And yet, I was just doing, uh, and I'm probably, and I'm, when we were talking, I'm going to bring that series here. I did the, remember when I did the Nazi Revolution? I think I'm eventually going to do the Nazi state. And I was going into this this morning, the Strength Through Joy program. Get a load of that handle, right? Strength through joy program. How the Nazis took the softer approach. Uh, the Nazi government urged businessmen to make it easier on the worker. How about making sure there's proper ventilation? How about making sure you give them good meals? Maybe at lunch or dinner if it's a night shift? How about making sure that the place is clean? How about making sure that they're, they're that, you know, that, that they're, that they're, uh, Greenery, how about that? Have an uplifting sort of uh, situation here to make the worker want to produce. That's what the Nazis were interested in. That's not Stalin. That's the Hitlerian approach. Is that a softer approach to get people to work? Sure is. And you don't think people didn't go along with this? Many sure did. So why wouldn't you support Hitler, right? 
Ah, back to Mike Fry. Right. The the sign over Auschwitz. Right. Right. In a way, it is. Only they're pro worker. Yeah, what do you have to do to, to enjoy this? Well, I'll go back to May 1, 1933, uh, when, you know, when the German worker uh, wants the International Labor Day, you know, May 1, May Day, not like that silly day we have. You know, the May Day, Hitler says, yeah, sure, we'll give it to you. And they did, he did, he kept his promise. Next day, the, 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 the party labor, labor union, if you want to use that term, uh, <laughs> raided all the all the coffers of all the German unions, took the money out, and then killed the rest of the unions. There's only one union. It's the party. That's it. The cost here. But then again, with things like strength through joy, when you can promise, gee whiz, we'll lighten your burden. You know, gee, maybe with, with the strength through joy program, we'll make sure you get leisure time. You can go on hikes. You can go on vacation junkets. And you don't think some Germans didn't go along with this? Wow. But it doesn't work that way. It's all, it has to be paid for some kind of way. Uh, maybe they, maybe some of them do, but they're hoping it's not going to be. You know. Even Sanders said taxes are going to have to go up. Sanders said that. Well, maybe not as much as you think if you're willing to, if you're willing to shrink that tumor known as the American Empire and lance that boil known as the military, industrial, financial, security, congressional complex. That's where some of the money can come from, as well as the money, some of America's royalty is hiding overseas so it can't be taxed. There's trillions overseas. Yeah, okay, sure, sure. And so, yeah, and so this is, so this is two different approaches, but they both worked. Of course, maybe the Russian people aren't, what, aren't like what Germans are. There are differences between races, between people, even if they're on the same continent, there are differences here, societal differences, traditions, social mores, so on and so forth. And so, and so when you take a look at what Hitler, do, Hitler and the Nazis do here, you know, trying to bring the Germans back from 1918, 1919, and a depression in between, uh, what the Nazis are offering, hey, this ain't bad. Of course, you know how it's going to end up in the end. There's always a cost for that. There's always a cost for that. And so, in fact, in fact, the in fact the handout I had shows that from 1933 to 1939, more and more German workers were taking advantage of the strength through joy, taking these junkets, taking these maybe a getaway into the mountains or the beach for a weekend or several days. You know, people are going to be people are going to be enamored with this, and maybe they will go to work. Maybe they will produce. If you throw them some bones here, I mean the Nazis figured that out. But then again, you know when 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 you, when you look at the Nazis, and you know and I and I and I always say there's something to this. You know many of their many of their armbands and and flags at one point black with the white ball, black swastika. Well, what happens when you get the blood red flags with the white ball, black swastika? Or 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 the or the armband with the white ball, black swastika, but it's a blood red arm. Or those huge drapes, those 70, 80 foot drapes at the at the at the Muni at the Mini Munichs, right? At the rallies. Uh, they understood that the red was the color of the so of socialist and Marxist. So how do we get how do we get the worker to go from the left to the right? Appeal, you know. Plant that seed here. Gee, red can be a, a color for the right. And then I remember saying this one time at one of my classes at Newark Community College, and there was a young lady, and there was a lady sitting in the back, and she said, Is that why the Make America Great Again hats are red? Somebody's thinking here. Red states, yeah? And some of those red states are what? Rust Belt states? I remember listening to one guy, he says, Yeah, we went from in God we trust to in God we rust. Yep. Talk about disgruntlement. And so, yeah, uh, it's fascinating how some people will be able to, 
or somebody like a Viktor Orban. Why is he some, somewhat popular? Anti-immigration? And unlike Trump, he doesn't say fake news. He's willing to have the journalists come talk to him. <laughs> Maintain that popularity here. Fascinating what some people will do to get their agenda done and get the masses on board, even if they're willing to give up their rights or their ability to think clearly or freely. Maybe many people do want com a comfort zone instead of having to work for it or fight for it. And you get somebody like a Hitler come along, boy, have we got a deal for you. But this is what you have to do in the end. No. Yes? Now that's where Mr. Trump is now, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, could be. The world's largest democracy? Yep. And maybe he, maybe he learned from the West? You know. Uh, again, that remains to be seen here, too. Uh, you know, and they're in competition with China. And so to be in competition with China, shouldn't there be a strong centralized control to organize for that? And India does have a problem with poverty. They still do. Yeah, they still do. Of course, when you have a population of, what, 1.2 billion? I mean, 300 million people or 400 million people living in poverty is a lot. That's more than the entire population of this country. That's a lot of people who aren't sharing in the spoils here. Is that going to be an issue? Could be. Could be. Oh, it's corruption central. Like Iraq, maybe, or even Ukraine. I mean, it's corruption central. Or Washington, D.C. I remember writing in one of my commentaries, I said, yeah, I said, you know, talking about red states, blue states. Well, what about green? Isn't that Washington, D.C.? Money, right? Yeah, it's that off-ramp on 95 between Sodom and Gomorrah. Even my wife says, that's a little rough, isn't it? Yep, sure is. So, doesn't stop. But then again, go back to, the, go back to Davis and Lincoln, you know, and really tear apart what their presidencies were like with regards to organizing and keeping control. That's the thing, keeping control. Because, as I said, there were many people in Maryland that had Southern sympathies. And so if you have people that have Southern sympathies and you're getting into a war like this, can you trust all of them to keep, to keep civil? <laughs> no, not when the president has to go through the state at night. That's a problem. Wow. And then he'll... And then during the war, he'll have 15,000 people arrested. You know, and many, most of them will not go to civil courts. They'll go to military tribunals. I mean, military tribunals instead of civil courts. I mean, what kind of a country does that tell you you have? You know, and many will wind up in jail. Of course, many are going to, they're going to be released anyway when the war is over with. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, what kind of a country do you actually have for four years? Yeah, you sound like now you're, now you're going back to James Madison when he wrote in Federalist 38 if people were angels, you wouldn't need a government. But then again, since people aren't angels, you need a government. But then again, who governs the government? Okay, well, it's acknowledged that the people can be a check on the government, but who checks the people? So where are we? The chicken or the egg? What came first, right? Yeah. Yeah, because of the human condition, right? Yeah. The human condition. And so, you know, going back to your question, I, you know, to add to it, I remember two, uh, back in 2013, I saw a poll taken by, of, of Russians, and 28% really wanted a Stalin back because he represented order. <laughs> Stalin. And I, remember, and I remember I used to know a couple of guys who did a lot of business with Russia for years, even when it was the Soviet Union. And this goes back about the same time, maybe a year or two before, <laughs> they were in the Moscow airport getting ready to come home. 
And you know, you 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 go through the little stores in the in the airports, you know, and you buy your cigarettes or whatever. And they picked up some individually wrapped chocolates. They figured, well, okay, we'll bring them home for the kids, right? Russian chocolate. We'll see if they like that. And so they figured, well, let's try a couple. So they open, they took the they took the cellophane off, and that which is wrapped, which the candy itself is wrapped in this cheap tin foil. They took they undid the tin foil and took the chocolate off the tin foil. There's a picture of Stalin on the tin foil. <laughs> you know, 2010, 2011, the guy's been dead since 53. <laughs> yeah, Stalin. Yeah, great idea. But hey, that'd make great party favors. You know that? That'd make great party favors. Boy. Yeah. I like to do that. I like to do that at one of those extreme right wing rallies. You know, go there with party favors and have Stalin. Wow, that'd be great. Heck with Sanders. Let's use Stalin. <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. I mean, I, I, and they're telling me this story. I start laughing. And uh, they, they, they had to look twice. Stalin. And I think, and you ate that candy? How old is that candy? <laughs> you know. Because I remember that old, what is that, that old Rodney Dangerfield quip? We have stuff in our icebox so old. He says, I remember seeing a, a milk carton in my icebox that had the Lindbergh baby on the, on the, on the, on the milk carton. Oh, even the Rodney. Uh, the 100th anniversary of the woman's right to vote. So next week I'll be doing the woman's suffrage. And so, but yeah, it'll be uh, that. 100th anniversary of women's right to vote will be the suffragette movement. The second talk will be on the 19th Amendment itself. And then the third talk is Susan B. Anthony. And then the last talk is Helen Keller as a socialist. She is an interesting person politically. She really is. And um, uh, she's she was one of those who really um, she campaigned for Eugene Debs every time he ran for president. Uh, she supported Lenin's revolution in 1917. Uh, she and the handout I have for that talk, you know, there, there's about a page and a half the biographical information, but the second half, and here not everybody gets the same handout because I I, I researched a lot of her writings as a socialist and what she was writing in newspapers and magazines. And so there's like five different handouts because there's examples of her writing as a socialist. They're interesting to read. They really are. But it irks me that that end of this lady is left out, usually, when they talk about her. And I don't think you get a fuller picture unless you understand. And I'm going to go into how she overcame blindness and deafness. I mean, that, that alone is a remarkable story. It really is. And then some of the people she meets along the way, like one of her best friends was, was Mark Twain, who said about her, he said, two of the most remarkable people to ever come out of the 19th century are Napoleon and Helen Keller. <laughs> well, I, chronologically, I guess, yeah. Uh, but she was friends with Emma Goldman, John Reed. Uh, she knew a lot of those people. Um, she was really an interesting character. She really was. She'll write, she'll write 12 books. She'll speak in 25 different countries. She was a remarkable individual. She really was. A remarkable individual. Um, overcame a lot. And did a little bit too. So. But her political, her political belief here is, is, is fascinating to see. And I'm going to go into that when I do that talk. But Susan B. Anthony is a class by herself. Like a lot of those ladies were. Uh, Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucy Stone, Julia Howe. I mean, they're, they're, they're all great in their own way. And Harriet Tubman, I wish I had time. I'd do a talk on her. She's an interesting individual, Harriet Tubman. Going from a, being an escaped slave to an abolitionist and then a suffragette. You know, she ran the gamut here. Although Susan B. Anthony was an abolitionist before being a suffragette. So, 
and one of her brothers fought with John Brown in Kansas. I like that for Quakers. Interesting group of people coming up here. What? Um, I mean, there, there's there's just so many. Of, I, well, you know what what I what I really find interesting about the the woman's movement, if you want to use that term. You know, when you go back to the 19th century, Stanton, uh, you know, Stone and Lucretia Mott, all these ladies. And then as they're dying out, you got the fresh crop coming up, like Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, and who was a little younger than her, Amelia Earhart, uh, Margaret Sanger, uh, people like uh, Helen Keller. And they're like, they're taking the woman's movement and then just they're going into these different avenues, but they're raising the stature of women here. I mean, Amelia Earhart, who, flying, isn't that a man's province here? Not necessarily. Or Margaret Sanger, Planned Parenthood, and she was into eugenics, family planning. And I'm going to get into her a little bit, because when I do Helen Keller, she was, also in a, she was also into women's health and eugenics, Helen Keller. She had a wide range of, of, of interests. This lady. Wide range of interests, which irks me that a lot of this is left out. Left out. And she'll write a couple of books on socialism. Mm. Yep. Interesting. Fascinating. But when you see the handout for next week, uh, the, the <laughs> I think it's why women, why men need women to vote. <laughs> It's, it's, some, it's written along those lines. Uh, I'm sure there were some men who, uh, you know. <laughs> so. But I'll get into all that because, it, again, the woman's movement is fascinating. Just like the black movement was uh, or is. Right? And even if you go to the Commerce Department today, you'll find women still get paid on the whole 70% of what men get paid for doing the same job. So how, have women come a long way? Yes. Is there a long way to go? Yes. Yes. Fascinating. Anyway, otherwise that's it. <laughs>